Moore Johnson Air Force Base is the normal home station for the 4th TAC fighter wing. But rebuilding of the 11,000-foot runways has necessitated a move. Within four months, construction engineers will have replaced 27,000 tons of old runway surface with enough concrete to build a 17-mile-long two-lane highway. While the tempo of work reaches a feverish pace at Seymour Johnson, the regular inhabitants have deployed to far-flung bases. Among them, the 4th TAC fighter wing, the first F-105 wing in the Air Force, moved their aircraft and about 1,000 officers and men to Brookley Air Force Base, Alabama. The deployment under combat conditions is another facet in the combat readiness training of this nation's first Mach 2 fighter wing. While ground crewmen ready their powerful fighter bombers, the combat crews leave the briefing tent, ready for a training mission. The 4th Fighter Wing has an illustrious history. In two wars, it has produced 94 aces and is credited with destroying 1,506 enemy planes in the air and on the ground. Attack fighter wing trains day by day, the United States Air Force adds new strength to its overall combat capability. Strength to meet any challenge, large or small, general conflict or limited war. To an outfit with an outstanding record of professional airmanship, we say hats off to the 4th TAC fighter wing, soon to be combat ready at twice the speed of sound. This is Orlando, Florida. MM-1 Terra cruisers arrive with their lethal load to give missile-conscious Central Floridians a first-hand look and listen to a tactical missile countdown. The TV show also provides these missile men with a training exercise in deploying their missile to an entirely new site for a simulated launch. With their equipment in place, it's time for the show. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host for Digest, Bill Berry. And present with us this evening as our guest is Colonel Van Sladen, the commanding officer of the 4504th Tactical Missile Training Wing from Orlando Air Force Base. Colonel, it's a pleasure to have you here with us, sir. Thank you. And I understand that your outfit is practically the only one of its kind in the United States Air Force. That's correct, Bill. We run the Air Force Tactical Missile School here at Orlando. And which missiles do you use for training? We have the Matador and the Mace missiles. And here behind me, I have a Mace. That's the newer of the two. As the announcer and Colonel Slayton explain the steps in launching the TM-76 Mace, the crew performs the countdown and engine run-up. The television audience sees for the first time on live TV the skills and professionalism of the men who train our Air Force's tactical mobile missile teams. The launch on film climaxes the Mesa's starring performance on live TV. At the Federal Aviation Agency's Experimental Center in Atlantic City, a new automatic landing system is being checked out by airmen who will eventually operate the equipment when it becomes a functioning system in air traffic control. Mobile radar equipment scans the approach end of the runway and feeds information on range, glide slope, and airspeed to a console which presents this information visually to the system operator. This is much the same as GCA. However, it carries the principle one step further. An autopilot, slave to the equipment by radio signals, will make it possible for the pilot to make a hands-off landing. Thus, aircraft fitted with the automatic equipment may be landed at a rate of better than one per minute in any kind of weather, 
with the pilot responsible only for power adjustments. Constantly improved air traffic control equipment provides safety for military and civil aviation. This is the North American GAM-77 or Hound Dog missile. This jet-powered weapon is designed to supplement the tremendous striking power of the B-52. It is carried one under each wing and is capable of delivering a nuclear warhead. Advanced testing of the system is now going on at Eglin Air Force Base. The Hound Dog is 43 feet long and powered by a 7,500 pound thrust turbojet engine. Its inertial guidance system is under control of the B-52 Navigator right up to the time of launch. The Hound Dog can provide multiple advantage for our manned heavy bomber force. Being supersonic, it can sweep aside enemy ground-based defenses or take out a strategic target. This means that B-52s fitted with Hound Dogs could strike targets thousands of miles apart during a single mission. This is the McDonald GAM-72 Quail, a decoy missile and another valuable adjunct to the B-52. Several of these 10-foot-long, lightweight diversionary missiles may be carried in the B-52's bomb bay. Their mission is to divert enemy defenses from the B-52. The quail, which can be sent off in a different path from the bomber, provides the identical reflectivity on ground radar scopes as a B-52. The purpose is to spread the enemy's defenses so thin that the bomber force may penetrate more easily. With multiple launches of the quail, the enemy's detection devices will be saturated and confused, thus boosting the deterrent effectiveness of strategic air command's manned bomber force. A Shia Air Base is the scene of an exercise to test the mobility of the 659th Tactical Hospital. This is one of four C-130s bringing in a 50-bed hospital which is an element of the 1st Medical Services Wing at Tachikawa Air Base to the north. The airlifted hospital was loaded aboard the C-130s in two and a half hours and flown the 600 miles to Ashia before noon. The 96 doctors, nurses, and medical technicians which staff the hospital all pitched in to get it into operation. With all the skill of circus roustabouts, these airmen have their tent hospital set up in jig time. Units of this type are geared for fast movement to areas of military trouble or natural disaster. The facilities are modern in every respect and can support 50 patients in beds and many outpatients for periods up to 60 days without resupply. The 659th TAC Hospital proves capable of meeting the challenge of a modern mobile air force. This C-130 is a long way from home it's one of 12 airplanes of the 61st Troop Carrier Squadron at Seward Air Force Base, Tennessee, whose summertime mission is the resupply of dewline sites in the Arctic wastes of northern Greenland. Glaciers, jagged mountains, windswept snowfields, and biting cold. These are the conditions the air crews face in supplying our Arctic outposts. Die 2, a little patch of ice and snow with a big mission. It may be a little primitive and a bit crowded in the control tower, but it's the only traffic facility for a good many miles.
last spring and summer, the 61st flew 603 round trips to Dai Tu, hauling 6,500 tons of construction equipment and supplies. The yearly requirement of 100,000 gallons of fuel oil will mean some 133 round trips. This site is still under construction. It's resting on 150 feet of snow, which lies on top of 8,000 feet of ice. It only snows about three feet a year. The trouble is, none of it ever melts. Cargo offloaded, and it's time for another round trip to Sandestrom and back with more supplies for America's distant early warning posts high on the Greenland ice cap. This is not a paperweight, nor an ashtray, but a scale model of a vertical takeoff and landing research vehicle known as Avrocar. The Avrocar, which appears for all the world to be a flying disc, was developed under Air Force contract by the Avro Aircraft Company Limited of Canada and made its first ground tests in February of this year in Toronto. On the ground, this research vehicle operates on a cushion of air. After obtaining a minimum velocity, it will function as an aircraft, supported by aerodynamic forces generated by its forward motion. Air Force interest in this vehicle began in 1955, when it initiated the contract to investigate the Avro VTOL concept. In early 1958, the project was redirected to meet the needs of the Army as well as the Air Force. New concepts in aerospace operations, the challenge of a forward-thinking Air Force.